Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with strength and conditioning coach and applied strength and power researcher, Matt Jordan. Hi guys, welcome to episode 46 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So today we have Matt Jordan on the phone. So Matt was the first speaker at the Seattle Sounders Sports Science Weekend and after hearing what he had to say, um, and he was mobbed at the end so I couldn't actually ask him at the time, but I had to get him on the podcast so everyone else could hear what he had to say. So today we discuss why and how we're assessing power, we discuss force velocity profiling, and monitoring athlete readiness and the reason why i think matt's lecture was so well taken from the guys at the conference was that it was delivered in a kind of a case study format so this is what we did with our uh, alpine skiers this is what we found and this is how we're gonna use information to actually guide our practice in the future so it's a really great lecture by matt um, and again like i said something that i wanted everyone else to hear so just before we get onto the chat with Matt, just want to say that there's a really exciting development for the Pacey Performance Podcast, which will be announced next week. So really looking forward to let you know what that is. So over the next couple of weeks, we've got some great guests. We've got Ben Peterson, we've got Derek Evely, and we've got Brett Bartholomew, just a couple of the, the names that are going to come up over the next couple of weeks. So make sure you keep checking back to paceyperformance.co.uk um, because there's going to be really some great, some great podcasts coming up. So you can also check out me on Twitter at paceyperform and I'll put all the uh, episodes as they go live on there. You can also check back to paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash podcast and you can catch up with all the previous episodes on there. So before I go any longer, here is the talk with Matt Jordan. Hi guys, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. So again, I'm piggybacking on um, one of the one of the speakers in Seattle um, that, I, that I heard this year in Matt Jordan. So got Matt on and just want to thank him for his time. And just before we get into the, the meat of the conversation, um, just wanting to give the, uh, Matt to give us a bit of a info on his, his background, his experience. So welcome to the podcast, Matt. Oh, thanks very much. I appreciate it. No worries, mate. So your, your background, your experience, and, and what you're currently doing. Yeah, so background-wise, I um, was always uh, super passionate about the weight room. Uh, I'm talking from the age of like 13. Um, it was a, uh, something I just loved to love to do. And I uh, was a, an athlete um, through high school, uh, basically. my uh, And so I grew up in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. Um, and then uh, in... Um, Basically, in 92, I moved out here to train at, our, at a training center here in Calgary, uh, spent about, you know, um, eight months in the, in the training program and then um, got into kinesiology and I got exposed to, to basically uh, the fact that you could have a career as a strength coach. Um, Charles Pollockin was the strength coach here at the time, actually. And, uh, you know, I, he was the strength coach working with all the teams. I thought this is this is the career for me. So. Started working with the uh, Olympic athletes in 1998 um, uh, after I graduated from kinesiology, went and did a master's in muscle physiology. And uh, essentially after that point, I was uh, working with Olympic athletes and professional athletes for the better part of you know 10 to 15 years. Um, and in 2012, uh, I was working a lot with Alpine ski racers and we had after 2010, a ton of uh, ACL injuries. So um, in 2012, I went back, uh, went back to school the age of 37, so it was uh, late in the game, but uh, bit the bullet, went back and um, started working on a PhD in medicine, um, in the faculty of medical science, looking at uh, uh, ACL injury prevention in ski racers. <clears throat> so that's the, that's kind of the history of it, and you know now we've got a we've got a, a big team of strength coaches up at the Canadian Sport Institute Calgary. So I oversee that group. Um, I help them with all their science and periodization and that sort of thing. I, I'm a performance consultant for Alpine Canada leading up their sports science and sport medicine and then uh, i've got my own private uh, consultation that i do through my business just in terms of education and uh, you know seminars that sort of thing um for uh just in, in the private industry cool so you said the the, the phd is still ongoing 
Yeah, I've got a, about a year left to go here. It's funny, this PhD, it's going to be the quickest degree I've ever completed. My undergrad took me like seven, eight years. My master's took me right to the brink. I went right to four years. And um, yeah, I mean, this PhD, I'm, I'm sort of entering now into my, I guess I'd be entering into my fourth year as of September. So um, I, I foresee probably about another year as of probably this coming September. So yeah, it's got a, just got a couple more projects left to wrap up. Piece of cake compared to the undergrad. Yeah, I know. I mean, uh, you know, it's funny. It's uh, my motivation is you know obviously they always you always hear this, but when you're you know when you when you go back to do something late in the game and it's your choice to be back, you know you you tend to be much more motivated than you were when you were 18 years old and wanting to go out to the to the bars on Friday night and whatever exactly. else. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. Just let's get into the uh, the meat of the, the the chat, and I wanted to discuss a couple of things. I wanted you to discuss a couple of things that you'd um, you discussed quite extensively when when I heard you speak in Seattle, which was um, about about power. Um, and I just want you to kind of um, go into a little bit of your thoughts on, firstly, why we assess it um, and how we assess power. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's. Uh... I guess the story kind of goes, you know, when I, when I was, when I was coming up as a strength coach, I, you know, I was getting articles fed to me by, by, by different mentors at the time. And, and I was trying to figure out, obviously, you know, you, you had these strong individuals that um, were great in the weight room, but, you know, you got them onto the field of play and they weren't necessarily the top performers. And you, you saw these, you know, explosive athletes that, you know, were clearly dominating. And, you know, I, I, was reading about, you know, you know, um, uh, speed strength and, and power and what all this stuff was. And, um, you know, obviously, um, for me as a, as a, as a strength coach, it was a, a path that I went down for a, for a long time as, is sort of trying to, trying to find and identify what this ability power was, how to measure it, um, how to, how to train it. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, I think that the challenge when we start talking about power is that most most um, most uh, f people who are pure to physics would say that what we measure as strength coaches, this idea of power, that we're we're not we're not being scientifically accurate. Um, we're not we're not actually measuring power. Um, they would criticize the methods, the approach. There's been some really nice articles that have come out recently um, from from various authors just really challenging this idea of, you know, what, what is power anyways, and, and, and what are, what are we getting after? And so, um, you know, needless to say, I started off doing it the way most, most people do. I had a variation of, uh, variation of vertical jumps that I would do. Um, I uh, started just using a contact mat, obviously vertical jumping is a surrogate for measuring, you know, human muscle power. And, um, from there, you know, just progressed on to various types of technology, abandoned it at certain points in my career. And, um, now, um, I gotta be honest. I mean, I, 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 I don't really, um, assess power, uh, and put it at, at high, as on high, as high on my list of, of strength abilities as I used to. Um, so, uh, it's still, you know, still, still something that we're, we're looking at, but, um, you know, it's just the ebb and flow over time where you, you know, something comes in and you lock down on it and then you, you maybe realize there's some challenges with what you're measuring and, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, that's kind of the nutshell overview of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, so why, why hasn't it, um, why is it kind of switched to less of a priority than what it used to be? What, what's changed? Well, what, okay. What it boils down to me, uh, to is, is this, I mean, you know, I, I'll come back to the original, uh, statement there at the beginning here is that, you know, you see athletes on the field of play and there's athletes who are able to produce muscle force quickly. They're explosive. They're able to generate that um, that that muscle force in a, in a very dynamic way and obviously those athletes are the ones that jump high run fast accelerate quickly they've got all these uh, these different abilities and um, yeah I mean from from the standpoint of of um, of, uh, of, of power I mean w when let's say you're measuring you know let's say you're taking a vertical jump and a vertical jump is a relatively uh, simple movement in terms of technique let's say you're going to use that to um, to evaluate your athlete's explosive ability, 
when you get the ground uh, reaction force, you can you can for sure you know uh, analyze it and you can obtain power. But you know, really, what you're talking about at the end of the day is using the vertical jump as a surrogate to measure explosive human performance ability. And when you've got that ground reaction force and you're looking at you're looking at um, um, uh, you know assessing it, there's 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 like you know thirty variables you can pull out. And ultimately, for me, the factors that come into it are you know how the person jumps. Um, the, the performance metrics around the jump, which typically I just focus on uh, the takeoff velocity. And if I have those two elements as my sort of top priorities, they really do answer most of the questions I need to, to get out of, of how people perform is, you know, essentially how, how do they jump? Are they fast jumpers, slow jumpers? Are they better in uh, a counter movement jump or are they equally as good in a squat jump? And, and basically how do they perform? And, and I step back and I realize that that's just a way to assess um, the explosive ability of of athletes, and um, you know, when you when you kind of look at it in that sense, it frees you up from from um, you know just focusing solely on this metric of power, which can can it can lead you down some wrong paths. I mean, you know, I'll give you an example. I've got some athletes that um, are very long jumpers. They take time on the ground, and they happen to be very powerful. So if I'm but it, but in the context of of their sport, if I'm focusing on power, I might have an athlete who's who's more powerful than his counterpart, but because he's a slow jumper, when he actually performs in the sport, he's actually to a you know, he's actually a, at a deficit. So, you know, I started to see that, you know, yeah, power is this thing. And for sure, it kind of characterizes our athlete along athletes, along with, you know, elements like jump height and other variables that we can pull from a vertical jump. Um, but at the end of the day, there's other factors that just uh, matter more to me and from a performance standpoint. And I know this is something that you um, you discussed over in uh, over in Seattle uh, a month or two back. So what you're saying is the is the importance of technique and actually monitoring how they jump rather than the jump itself. Is that right? Yeah, you got it. I mean, it's um, you know the the challenge is, is that you know when when and I and I I'll give you some examples of over my career where this where this became problematic. I mean, start right from the get go. This is like you know naive strength coach coming in writing programs and. You know, my athletes would um, go through a, whatever, an 8, 10, 12-week training block. I was doing entry exit testing at the time and, and using the vertical jump as a, a method to assess power. And by this point, I was using linear position transducers and, and you know, um, uh, playing around with force plates, although we didn't really have good analysis capabilities at the time. Um, still using my contact mat periodically. And essentially what was happening is that in my test battery, the athletes would do vertical jumps on the, on the, um, on the, on the jump mat. We would do some loaded jumps with um, with uh, with a position transducer, and and um, you know, obviously, you you know, they they give you a value of power from 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 many of these uh, pieces of equipment. And what I was finding is is that as I went through the training block with this entry exit style training, is that my athletes would, um, you know, get through the training block. I'd give them three or four days rest, thinking thinking that they're ready to rock, and um, I test them, and they would they would all be worse, and. So, you know, you're, you're sitting there with your athletes and they're like, well, what's my score? What's my score? You know, and, and they look at it and they're like, man, that's worse than it was when I started. And so, you know, at the time, I mean, I was, you know, pretty, pretty baffled by this. I'm like, okay, well, I've given them some rest, so it shouldn't be fatigue. Um, you know, I, I, I think I've trained them well. I think I've done what I needed to do. And um, I guess what I was, I was missing at the time was all the confounders that go into, um, they go into jump performance. And I mean, one confounder is, is that if you're tired, or your legs are sore, or you're peaked, you change how you jump. I mean, that's the nice thing about human movement is that it's variable. And, and I've given some talks on, on movement variability over the past year and a half. It's something that intrigues me uh, very much. And, and essentially what it boils down to is, yeah, we, we can change how we move. And when we change how we move, it changes how we perform. So you could have athletes that have, have an alteration in their movement strategy that either inflates or deflates a jump height and or a jump performance and and therefore masks a potential training effect there not because the muscles aren't operating at a new level but because there's a confounder with how they're moving and what they're doing um so that was that was you know one element of of uh, you know um of the sort of how they move uh, why that becomes more of interest to me and, and you know again when i start to get down into a bit of the nuances of it and i start to really look at large groups of athletes i mean i sort of said this in um 
in Seattle with a couple of slides. But, you know, if I take our elite bobsledders, I mean, these guys are by far the most power, powerful athletes that come through our building. And when I say power here, I'm talking about, you know, taking the vertical jump, counter movement jump or squat jump and, and, and calculating uh, mechanical muscle power from the ground reaction force, which is, you know, a, a, you know, I guess a standard way to assess, you know, mechanical muscle power in, 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 in humans. And, um, you know, they, these guys are, these guys are, are super powerful, but when you take that group of 10 or 12, um, uh, of, uh, elite level bobsledders, and then you start to try and explain their performance in terms of pushing a bobsled, you start to see that the mechanical muscle power they generate in a vertical jump is really not related at all to the ability of pushing a bobsled or sprinting for that matter. So, you know, I, I mean, that's, that's where now it's like, okay, well, if I want to use, you know, the vertical jump as a surrogate to assess human explosive ability, I'm not only going to have to look at the variable that comes out in terms of my, my performance measure, but I'm also going to have to look at how they perform the jump. You know, um, I'm going to have to look at the ground contact times in their sport. I'm going to have to look, are they in a sport like speed skating where ground contact times are, you know, two, 300 milliseconds? Um, or am I in a sport like, um, you know, volleyball where it's absolutely key that they get up and off the ground as quickly as possible to block, to block, a, block a spike? Um, and, and those elements now tie in not only the performance aspect of, of, of jumping, but how they jump. And it ties into this idea now, okay, it's not just about the power variable that we can calculate, but now really looking at that force curve and, and figuring out the, the nuances of it um, from a training perspective. Cool. So how, so how are you, when you're testing your guys, how are you making sure that the, the kind of technique is what you want it to be? Um, well, that's a, you know, that's a good question. And I, and I kind of bounced back and forth over the years between two schools of thought. One school of thought says, you know what, don't, don't constrain the athlete by telling them what to do. Just let them jump and, and look at the jump strategy alongside the jump output. Um, and, and, um, and then I've gone back to saying, well, no, I really do want to look at jump output. I mean, I'm very interested in seeing improvements in, in explosive, uh, explosive performance. And, and, and I, you know, therefore if, if I'm, if I'm not controlling the depth of the jump and the athlete is working over a greater, uh, dis, uh distance, they're going to be performing they they'll, they'll be generating more power. But if they're in a sport that requires, you know, um, you know, a certain time frame to apply force that improvement in power might actually be irrelevant if, if it means that they are, they've, they've gone to this longer jumping strategy. So, um, you know, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, ultimately now where we're at is, um, you know, I, I, I basically have the athletes perform, um, unrestrained counter movement jumps. I essentially, you know, hands on hips, uh, start from a very static still position. I instruct them to jump and basically it's, you know, drop down, jump up as high as you can. And I ask them to perform the movement as fast as they can. Um, and, and other than those two general um, uh, cues, uh, I'm not constraining them at all. However, when we do the squat jump, the squat jump um, is, uh, um, you know, going from a static start position. And, and when, when my athletes, when we do, when we do our squat jump testing, um, there we, uh, we actually carefully control the depth. Um, and we've got video on them. We've got an external uh, reference point for them. Uh, we measure at the same point every time. So every time the athletes jump, we set the exact same reference point. So when we do longitudinal testing um, over, you know, many months, many years, we, we are always getting at least the squat jump uh, performed to similar knee angles um, across time, which I think is a, an important aspect of, uh, of testing. So are you, are you making sure them, uh, indi are they individual differences or are they, is that exactly the same for, for everyone? Well, we currently currently it's the same for um, everyone. We essentially set the, the the jump depth based on the person's um, based on the person's uh, anatomy, um, and we we we've got a sort of a standard procedure of doing that. Um, but it's a very interesting question because you know we've got I've got a you know elite level bobsledders where if I if I bring that elite level bobsledder down to a knee angle that let's say a speed skater or a hockey player performs at. Um, you can essentially render that bobsledder more or less completely useless in a, in, in a vertical jump. And that's the issue, right? I mean, if you, you know, if I, you know, and I'll take the counterpoint on this is let's say that I've got a speed skater or a hockey player, and let's say that they're very explosive athletes, but 
you know, their force length relationship isn't really tuned to skating where any, you know, skating sports, obviously you want a deeper knee angle. I mean, ideally you're probably at, you know, um, uh, 90 or, uh, you know, 80 to 90 degrees of knee flexion. So, you know, your, your ideal skating position is, is a low knee angle. So if you've got skaters that are really explosive, so they can perform super well in the vertical jump, but they can only do that if they're, you know, coming down to knee angles of, let's say, 30, 40 degrees, the challenge there is that they perform awesome in your test, but then you put them on the ice and they, you know, they can't skate, right? Because they don't have that skating specific strength, that skating specific, you know, the ability to get those low knee angles. Um, so, you know, again, it's it's uh, evolving now where we're, we're, we're really starting to take a focus of, you know, what what are the demands of the sport? Uh, what are the, wh how does this athlete solve the sporting movement, you know, and, and, then, and then tailoring our tests uh, in a bit more sport specific way. Uh, so our bobsledders, we have a slightly higher knee angle, um, whereas our speed skaters, we test them at a, a lower knee angle to, to reflect what we want them to do on ice. So I just want to move on a little bit. Um, something that's kind of um, become very popular is force velocity profiling because of the, you know, my jump app and things that have become uh, more readily available and cheap. Um, do you just want to give us your your kind of um, your thoughts on on force velocity profiling? Yeah, I mean, again, it's you know, it's something that you know, I very early on in my career. I, I, you know, intuitively, I was like, okay, this makes sense. I mean, my athletes, I, I know muscle has a, you know, sort of that hyperbolic force velocity relationship. Um, I know that with training, you know, I'm kind of in, in theory trying to influence potentially either end of that, of that curve where I'm, I'm doing, let's say, more hypertrophic type training or maximal strength training to do influence the force end of the force velocity relationship. And, the, uh, you know, the more higher velocity movement, uh, reactive strength type training to influence the velocity end of the spectrum. And, you know, I, I bring athletes in, we do uh, loaded jumping with, um, started off with the jump mat, basically, you know, uh, load the athlete up with, with, uh, with increasing loads, usually as percentages of body weight. Um, and then I would um, have the athletes perform, um, as time went on, we got the linear position transducer. So we, we use that for a spell. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, long story short is I was still, you know, having t trouble really connecting my training program to what I was seeing in terms of the testing results. There was a gap. There was a, there was, a, um, um, you know, a, 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 a divergence in, in what I would see in terms of the adaptation. And, um, you know, as time went on, I, 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 I uh, kind of, I, I mean, I stopped doing the, the pure velocity, force velocity profiling. And essentially, I had two tests. I did, um, uh, well, we did three. We did a squat jump, a counter movement jump, both unweighted hands on hips. And then we did um, um, a standard uh, uh, squat jump and a standard jump squat with a trap bar uh, for female and male athletes at different loads. And so essentially I treated them independently. I had, you know, I had values that came out for the unloaded jump and I had values that came out for the, the loaded jump. And I, um, yeah, that's how I treated it. Now I know lots of, lots of stuff has come out about force velocity profiling, but a, an article that really shifted my viewpoint on this, actually an experience was, um, last, um, was it last, it was last summer. I was in Amsterdam at the European college of sports science conference. And there were uh, a couple of uh, sessions on force velocity profiling and, you know, some of the proponents of doing this with athletes, you know, they were presenting and, and sharing their thoughts. And one of the sessions was chaired by Martin Bobber, who um, Martin Bobber was actually, uh, uh, he's, a, he's a biomechanist in, out of uh, the Netherlands. And he was actually, um, I believe he was a postdoc at the University of Calgary, which is um, the lab that I, I do a lot of my work out of here in Calgary. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, the Human Performance Lab in Calgary is, is world renowned for its biomechanics research. So we've had a lot of really impressive individuals come through there, you know, including Vladimir Zatsiorsky spent some time up at University of Calgary. Like there's been uh, some great, great individuals who've come through. Um, anyways, Bobbert uh, really challenged um, the presenters on what they were doing, their approach, their methodology. And I had some really long conversations with him after the fact and exchanged um, a handful of emails, um, uh, very detailed emails, uh, which I'm, I'm surprised he took the time to respond to because they were, they were long emails from my point because I had a lot of questions about his perspective on it. And essentially what it boiled down to is he's like, listen, Matt, there's, there's, th there's many factors that go into um, the uh, outcome or force output 
of a muscle. You've got the force length relationship, you've got activation, neural activation, um, and you've got the force, the intrinsic force velocity relationship of a muscle. And obviously what we're, we're expecting here is that if we do a loaded jump test, that after training, the force velocity relationship of the muscle is, is changing in such a way that it will reflect in the tests that we're doing where we load our athletes up and, and perform uh, vertical jumps at various loads. And his modeling experiments um, that he's done um, pr clearly suggests that at least with humans, the big, the big challenge is, is that your force length relationship, your neural activation and your intrinsic force velocity relationship of the muscle likely co-vary with each other when you do loaded jumping. So if you're taking, let's say, a loaded counter movement jump at, let's say, 100% of body weight and comparing it to an unloaded counter movement jump with body weight, the idea here is, getting back to how people change their strategy, is that athletes change how they jump with load and without load. So if you're changing how you jump with and without load, if you're changing the force length relationship, right, maybe you're going to a slightly uh, less uh, deep knee angle when you've got the load, um, you're, uh, you're modifying this. Uh, if you're not used to performing loaded jumps, you're going to change your activation strategy so you're not able to activate maybe to the same level that you would with an unloaded jump. Now, all of a sudden, the changes in your force velocity relationship are co-varying with these other two important factors. And as a result, his suggestion is, is that you're, you're likely missing um, important, uh, important features of, uh, of, uh, you know, of movement. And you're also um, probably, um, you know, you're probably, you know, obscuring what actually is happening at the physiological level. And, and that really brought a lot of insight to me. And, and obviously, I mean, I saw this before. I mean, when I load an athlete up with 100% of body weight, um, there's no question. They don't, they, they, don't, they don't jump the same way with load as they do unloaded. Um, and, and you can control for that, but you know, this, this becomes sort of the problematic, um, uh, problematic issue in my mind with force velocity profiling. So essentially you're trying to reflect this intrinsic muscle, uh, force velocity relationship, but you've got all these other factors that are co-varying alongside that, which are making it really difficult to figure out what the heck's happening. Um, the last thing that I'll, I'll say is that, you know, on numerous occasions, and I'll come back to my, uh, my example where there, where I gave my athlete three or four days rest. And, um, you know, I'd go back and test them in the vertical jump and their vertical jump performance would still be depressed. Like it was, it was, it was, it was down. And, you know, at the time I, I was like, what the heck's going on here? But, you know, now I know, I mean, low frequency fatigue can persist for, and, and I mean, I've seen it per persist for, you know, seven, eight, nine days, even sometimes, in, you know, a couple of weeks in athletes after big training blocks. And so what you have is you have a divergence in the improvement of, loaded jump performance and unloaded jump performance. So at the end of the training block, whereas the unloaded counter movement jump is still depressed, I could actually see an increase in the loaded jump performance, which is very standard just based on, you know, the, the, the you know, um, calcium transients that you would see in a, in a, in a low frequency fatigue state. Um, you know, low frequency fatigue affects that rate of force development. Uh, you know, when you get to heavier loads, you're able to compensate a lot of times for for the presence of low frequency fatigue, and, and you just can't compensate when you've got unloaded unloaded um, movements that are of a high, higher velocity. So the challenge here is, is if I perform a, a loaded jump and an unloaded jump at the end of my training block, how do I know when both of them have reached the same point in terms of the um, the temporal nature of the recovery of the parameters? So if I'm you know, if, if my athletes are still fatigued and, and have that sort of low frequency fatigue, essentially you could have a depression in the counter movement jump unloaded. You could have an improvement in the loaded performance. That's going to give you a totally different picture of how your force velocity relationship shifted. Um, not based on the fact that you had a, you know, a pronounced training effect, but just because on the, on the fact that you still have uh, an interaction here between the sort of fit, fitness component and the fatigue component. Um, so I guess all these things together, um, you know, to me, just basically, um, not that it, not that it shuts down the, the, the potential for force velocity profiling. It just introduces to me a whole bunch of issues that, um, as a strength coach and when I'm trying to really profile my athletes that really get in the way of me wanting to see what I want to see. And, and so as a result, what I do is we do, we do weekly unloaded jump testing. We do that, uh, every Monday we do counter movement jump and squat jump testing. Sometimes we're doing it twice a week. And we do our loaded, uh, our loaded jump testing at uh, less frequent intervals, usually about once every two weeks to once every three weeks. And essentially, we get a, a time series of 
of uh, loaded jump performance and unloaded jump performance that we treat separately. We don't plot them on the same curve uh, or on the same on the same graph. We, 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 we treat these variables as two independent unique variables, understanding that you know, the way the athletes move when they jump with load is not the same as the way they do when they're unloaded. There's kind of varying, you know, factors along with both and, and obviously a divergence, as I said, in, in the recovery of both of these parameters after training. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, sorry to ramble on there, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's sort of uh, where I'm at with it. So you're, so you're, looking, at, you're looking at takeoff velocity as the main parameter? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, yeah, ultimately, you know, it's it's jump performance. I mean, you know, how people jump it, you know, it's absolutely critical. Um, and, but but ultimately, you know, when when you're when you're talking about the performance variables of jumping, so you know, mean power, peak power, uh, rate of power development, rate of force, you know, all these variables that have been put out there. At the end of the day, it's just jump performance, which essentially is how high you jump. And, and uh, takeoff velocity that we, we assess um, um, through the ground reaction force is essentially going to give you your jump height. So that's the variable we, we use. And, and one of the reasons that we, we really like it is when we, um, before we do any testing on our athletes, we always assess the reliability of the measures uh, within each sport and within each level of the sport. So suppose I'm working with development ski racers. I will assess the reliability of my measures with that group specifically. Um, and then, you know, if I'm working with uh, elite level, um, you know, bobsledders, we'll do the same thing. And not only do we do this sport specific and level specific um, reliability assessment, but then we also sort of put this all into one big common uh, spreadsheet. So we have this ongoing um, data set where we're evaluating the reliability of the different measures that we look at. And with that said, time and time again, over and over again, the coefficient of variation for takeoff velocity and a vertical jump for both counter movement jump and squat jump are super super tight. They're 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 excellent. They're under a lot of times under one percent for most of our groups. Whereas power um, is you know sort of in the range of two to three percent, which is still excellent. But for us, we you know when we're we're trying to detect small changes in athletes, you know with the fatigue or you know small improvement in performance. We tend to gravitate towards the parameters that are, are more stable over time. So takeoff velocity just happens to be that one value for us from a performance aspect. That's simple, straightforward. We know what it means. Um, easy to measure. Easy to easy to pick out. You know, you don't doesn't. It's not it's not hard to analyze a ground reaction force of a vertical jump and and to, and to uh, uh, grab that value. Um, and ultimately, it's uh, it tells us what we want to know. Are our athletes getting more explosive as as measured in the vertical jump? Mm -hmm. Cool. Sounds great. So I just want to um, take a little left turn and, and discuss um, something else that you spoke of um, in Seattle, which was um, assessing asymmetries and, and predicting injuries. And you kind of, you tied that in with a few nice, um, and nice falls on the slopes. Um, but you just want to talk to us a little bit about that, um, about how you, you are assessing asymmetries and, and, and whether it's, you're able to predict the injuries. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, you know, the asymmetry testing for us, it, you know, I, I have to admit, I kind of stumbled on it. I mean, as a, as a strength coach, I think um, we all, you know, we're all looking for asymmetry. I mean, we, 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 that's an easy thing to pick out in movement. You can often, um, you know, uh, see that in, in your athletes when they're, when they're, when they're doing, you know, various, uh, various types of exercise, but, um, you know, really stumbling on the asymmetry path was uh, totally random. I mean, we were down in Colorado in 2008 at the International Conference on Strength Training. Um, had a, a great presentation by Per Agard, who's uh, one of my, uh, he's on my PhD committee. And um, for those of you who don't know Per, I mean, he's a wonderful human being, great man and, and uh, extremely knowledgeable uh, in, in the area of biomechanics and, and applied strength and power research. And, um, you know, Per gave a great presentation on, um, all the different types of testing he'd done with uh, with um, uh, with force plates, looking at vertical jump and and how it related to sport performance. And it was so funny at the time that another presenter in the same session came out later on and basically pointed out that about a decade of um, strength and conditioning research had um, actually calculated power the wrong way. Um, and, and so it was really a moment where I was like, holy smokes, like here I am, like I, I've, I've kind of had that sense that we're not doing things right here. And so I just, I dumped it all, man. I dumped the jump mat, I dumped the tendo, I dumped everything. I'm like, okay, I'm moving on. I'm going to figure out how to use these force plates. But the limiting factor was they're freaking 20 grand and we had no money. 
Um, and I was really fortunate that we were touring around the uh, uh, Colorado Springs, the USOC, and we met Bill Sands, who is the uh, sports science director at um, uh, at uh, US the USOC, and he introduced us to this company called Pasco. And and we're you know he basically is like, listen, you can get force plates, accelerometers, you can get anything you want, and it's cheap. They basically make this equipment for high school physics classes. We've we've tested this stuff out. It's good. It's valid. It's reliable. It gives us what we want, and and it's affordable. And so. As soon as we got back to Calgary, uh, my my uh, my my counterpart uh, counterpart Scott Ma and myself, we we bought our our first set of force plates for about two and a half grand. And uh, the only problem was these force plates were literally like one foot by one foot, and you couldn't um, you couldn't have athletes jump on them. There's just what they just weren't big enough. So we said, well, we have to order two. Um, we have to have a dual force plate system. Otherwise, we can't we can't assess uh, we can't assess our athletes. We'll just sum the ground reaction forces from left and right, and and we're bam, we're we're good to go. So I talked to Pear about how to analyze the vertical jumps, and and you know away we were we were off. We were testing. I mean, I tested everybody that year. We did all kinds of different testing. You know, we had um, high level Canadian weightlifters on there performing. You know, 180 power 100, 180 kilo. Um, uh, cleans. We had, you know, elite level bobsledders performing, you know, jump squats with 100 kilos. We did all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, but what I was starting to see was that my athletes coming back from injury, um, if I put them on the force plates, I was like, oh, this is great. I can actually qualitatively view the deficit between the left limb and the right limb. And so essentially, I'd start putting athletes on the force plates, you know, squatting and jumping as they were coming back from injury, just to qualitatively say, hey, are you more symmetrical? And as time went on and I started working with alpine skiing, I had this bigger group of athletes that were coming back after injury. And a, a big challenge for us is that we we often send them back at the wrong time uh, because we're relying too heavily on subjective measures. So, you know, a surgeon checks out the knee, feels stable, the physio puts them through some subjective tests. And, you know, ultimately when enough time goes by, we say, all right, well, I guess you're good. You know, it's, it's time to go back. And the challenge with that is that when you have a ski related ACL injury, a simple ACL injury can be a classic return to sport in about, you know, six, seven months. Um, but if you do uh, one of these sort of high energy major jobs on your knee, um, you can end up with uh, huge amounts of trauma that can take you, you know, 12, 16, 18, 20 months to get back from. And so, whereas we had coaches who just understood that, oh, athletes had an ACL injury, so we should have them back by about, you know, seven, eight, nine months. In reality, we've got an athlete here who's got a major, major injury, and they're going to need something more like 16 months. And so all of a sudden, the force plate data became very valuable because now I could say, well, listen, like, you know, here's normal asymmetry with our skiers, and this person's still at like 25%. So they're not ready yet. You need some more time. And so it started to guide my process. Um, and, and really what I started to see when I was looking at the literature is that nothing exists on return to sport in ski racers. Um, there's very little... Um, information on that and, and these guys uh, suffer ACL injuries at a very predictable rate and so that, that at that point uh, you know I started at this point I was you know conversing quite a bit with Pear and going back and forth and he was doing some very interesting work on asymmetry uh, um, looking at asymmetries in, in ACL uh, injured uh, individuals and so that was it we just uh, we jumped on it and you know now it's become um, you know, a standard part of our assessment uh, protocol for all of our athletes. And, and you, you ask the question about whether or not it's predictive of injury. Um, you know, we, we're, we're always challenged in elite sport by having enough, enough subjects to really answer good questions, you know, or answer questions properly from a statistical standpoint. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I got 10 skiers in a, in a group. It's, it's super hard for me to have enough skiers over time. It'd probably take me a decade to get enough injuries to really answer those sorts of questions. Um, but last summer, what we did is we tested um, basically 66 athletes from uh, wrestling, um, soccer, uh, from uh, rugby, and from alpine skiing. And we tested them at the beginning of the season, and we followed them throughout their, their, their season, and we tracked, we tracked knee injuries. And essentially, the question was, does functional asymmetry in a counter movement jump and in a squat jump, does it predict uh, knee injuries in these athletes? And um, over the study period, we ended up having eight injuries, which again, isn't a lot. You probably want something like 20 or 30 to really do the right statistical analysis on, on this type of data. But, you know, we just don't have enough athletes. Uh, you know, we would need a sample size of a couple hundred to do that, which we, we didn't have. 
Um, nevertheless, we went back, we ran the numbers, and 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 lo and behold, the uh, asymmetry in the eccentric deceleration phase of a counter movement jump um, was predictive of of, um, of of knee injuries in this group. Um, now again, it's it's tough with the data because we don't have a lot of injuries. Um, but by the same point, even if you just visualize the scatter plot, you can kind of see a cutoff of about probably around sort of 15% where your uninjured athletes start to thin out a little bit on the scatter plot and, and, and where you start to see the appearance of injured athletes. And you see another cutoff at 20% where above that, you only see the injured athletes. So, you know, in our, in our mind, you know, we're not, you know, we're, we're, we analyzed it. We look at, we looked at the predictive value of it for sure. There was a statistical relationship there. I'll get hammered by every statistician out there that I, you know, I don't have enough subjects and, and whatnot, but from practical standpoint, even if we just, you know, eyeball the scatter plot, you can start to see that there's something there that could be valuable for, for guys like ourselves who are practitioners and wanting to be able to make decisions and say, when is my athlete uh, needing to um, either you know go see the go see the soft tissue therapist or the chiropractor or the physio or whoever you got working with you, or when does my athlete need to be scaled back in terms of the type of uh, of uh, exercises they're doing to avoid injury, um, and uh, yeah, so that's become a really important part of our of our testing battery here in in uh, in Calgary. So, so so what percentage are you is is the mark that you are wanting to hit, as in asymmetries between left and right? We we uh, you know we're 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 very careful not to view um, functional asymmetry as uh, what's optimal um, in the sense that you know anybody who's below ten or twelve percent to me is pretty close to fine you know I mean when you're ten percent hovering around ten percent sometimes I ask the question like what's going on with that guy um, you know is there something minor happening. But it doesn't change anything for me in my triaging at this point because I just don't think the science that we've done on this so far really warrants that. Um, where where we are really starting to um, you know raise red flags is when we have people that are above above fifteen percent, um, sort of twelve fifteen percent, and for sure anybody who's over twenty percent, um, and that's when that's where we're 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 taking it more seriously and starting to act on it um, in in some purposeful way. Cool. It just um, it just happens that you mentioned Pasco there. Cause I got an email earlier um, from from the masters course that I'm doing, saying that the um, that Pasco are doing a, a, a dual force plate for like 650 pounds, which yeah. um, which is absolutely absolute bargain. I don't know how much jump mats are. Maybe but pretty close to that actually. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, this, it's a great find, man. Like you know, the only challenge I'll say about Pasco, um, and I've emailed them several times to say hey if you guys would just partner with me on this we could you know you could, i think it'd bring you guys a lot of business but the big challenge is, is that this the, the analysis is really straightforward for any computer engineer software engineer type person i mean they sit down it's trivial they're like oh yeah you just got to do this this and this um i worked very closely with a, a software uh, person in calgary in my uh, phd group who uh, you know exclusively designed software for this type of uh, you know biomechanics related um, uh, research uh, project, and I mean seriously, we it took us probably uh, three years to get that script to, the, to where it is now, where it's you know doing what we wanted to do, um, and 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 if you don't have that, the challenge with it is that when we first started down this road, I literally would have to hand to analyze my jumps. So if you wanted to calculate power. For example, you know, you have a force curve, you have to basically, first of all, isolate each jump very carefully, you got to solve for acceleration, you got to take out the system mass, you got to, you know, integrate acceleration to get velocity, you got to make sure that you very carefully select the jump, take the product of force and velocity, um, you know, and, and, and then calculate the mean, if you're looking at mean power, yourself right and and it, so we were probably in the order of like i think by the end there we were probably down about took me about three to four minutes per file to analyze um but if you know like today we're testing on any given day we're testing probably 70 athletes in the morning um so you know there's just absolutely no way that you could hand analyze 70 jumps uh jump tests um it would take you you know it would take you like you know way too much time we just don't have that amount, amount of time so I guess my only caveat on, is on Pasco is that if you do get them, you just got to make sure you align yourself with a with a good software guy, or, or you, know, you can send me an email as well. That's one of the things that the the guy that I'm uh, working with here in Calgary that we're, we 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 provide coaches as we you know sit down with them and 
um, we help, we give them the code and we, we show them how to, how to, how to make it work for them. Um, and, uh, and, and it really saves you, I mean, a, a monstrous amount of time. Um, but, uh, that's the only caveat on it, but great, great equipment though. Great, great equipment. So can that be done remotely, Matt? Pardon? Can that be done remotely as in people that aren't in Calgary? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we do one of two things. I mean, I, I still, you know, I still have some, uh, strength coaches where they, you know, they dump their files in Dropbox and I, I run the files for them. Um, and then I interpret it back to them, um, so that they have an understanding of how to use it. That's the other challenge. I mean, with any, any instrumentation that we're doing these days or any sort of data collection is you got to know, you know, it takes some time to really figure out, you know, what matters and how are you going to use it? I mean, you can collect, you know, gigs of information, but if you don't really know what you're looking for, um, that just becomes a whole lot of noise for most of us. And we end up sitting there looking at, you know, spreadsheets, not really knowing what the heck to do with it. Um, so I still do some of that for, for some, some strength coaches where they literally dump the files in, I analyze it, interpret it back. We, we work together on it. Um, but the, the second option here is obviously to uh, work with, um, my, my software guy and myself. And, you know, we literally give you guys the code um, and, and help you, um, you know, get mastery of it so that you can actually just do your own analysis. Um, and there's, you know, there's other product, other companies out there that, that provide stuff along these lines. Uh, I think Zflow is another one that I've heard of where they, they, they give you an analysis, uh, software platform and, and the force plates, but you still can't beat the price of Pasco and, and having, you know, a custom software package. I mean, it's, it's just way cheaper. Well, thanks for that. I'll, uh, I'll put a couple of links to them, the th things you just mentioned there. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, I've kept you for nearly 45 minutes now, so I just want to round up real quick. Um, where can where can people um, keep in touch with what you got going on and maybe hear, hear you speaking? Uh, I know you're jet-setting about here and everywhere. Um, have you got, you know, kind of social media, your website, that kind of thing? Yep. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my my Twitter handle is um, at Jordan Strength. And um, I'm not a huge, uh, I don't tweet a ton, but when I do, it's it's typically something that I um, I thought was was relevant. So profound. They could, they could yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, try to, I try to do it when I feel like there's something valuable to share. Um, and then the second, uh, I've got my, my website, it's uh, www.jordanstrength.com. Um, that website, um, you know, I, I post on there, um, you know, just sort of upcoming things that we've got going on. Um, the other site I would uh, encourage people to visit is the uh, csicalgary.ca website, which is our uh, our institute in Calgary, because we put on um, uh, strength and power performance courses twice a year. So basically, we we have um, uh, sort of a we're we're a bit of a sisterhood right now with World Athletic Center, where uh, Stu McMillan and Dan Papp are out of. Um, we we've been working with them in sort of uh, collaboration to develop our our performance course. So it's modeled after their great uh, their great course that they offer down at the WAC. Um, we we focus more on the science end and more on the um, the testing end, but very similarly we have you know um, um, some course time, uh, classroom time, lots of time out on the gym floor with the strength coaches and in the strength lab, really getting a feel for the equipment, understanding how to apply this asymmetry testing and all this other stuff that we're doing. And then in the afternoons, we always kick it, finish it off with a sort of a round table, bring in all our strength coaches. So, you know, I've got a team of guys that I work with at the CSI Calgary who are all outstanding. And, uh, you know, when you get those 10 guys in a room and, and you know, the, the course uh, attendees and you start, you know, really chewing the fat on stuff, it's it's great conversation. So that would be the third website I'd say keep an eye on because if you if you head there, you'll be able to, you know, to find out when we have courses coming up and, and whatnot. Sounds great. I'll put... Um... I'll put links to all them on the site so people can get um, people can get a hold of them, get onto them. So just yeah, you know, like I said, I'll round up and uh, just thank you for your time. And I'll um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep in touch, Matt. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to speak to you for this. Well, he speak for the second time. Yeah, no, I, and I, I, again, I just want to say I uh, really appreciate what you're doing, and, and uh, I think it's a, it's great for our profession. And I want to thank you very much for for thinking of me and, and giving me the opportunity. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, yeah. mate. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to episode 46 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. I hope you enjoy the chat with Matt. Just on a side note, massive congratulations to both Matt and his family for the birth of their new baby boy. So drop him a, drop him a message uh, and offer your congratulations there. So over the next couple of weeks, like I said, we've got some great guests coming up. 
but you can check out all previous episodes of the podcast at paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash podcast. All the links to all the papers and information that Matt mentioned in this episode can be found at paceyperformance.co.uk forward slash 46. You can follow me on Twitter at paceyperform and keep up to date with everything that's going on the podcast and I'll let you know when all new episodes go live. But I will speak to you with more great guests in episode 47.